Welcome to the Electronic Archive of Presentations from Performance Incentives, The Growing Impact on American K-12 Education, a national conference hosted at Peabody College of Vanderbilt University in 2008. The conference was sponsored by the National Center on Performance Incentives, a research and development center funded in part by the U.S. Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences. You are watching a video presentation from Mr. Richard Rothstein, a research associate with the Economic Policy Institute on the experiences of public and private sector performance incentive systems and their implications for considering similar policies in American K-12 public education. My paper essentially argues that there is a great deal of literature and research on performance incentives and organizational accountability out there. Most of it comes from other fields outside education. Uh, and education researchers and enthusiasts for performance incentives in education have devoted much too little time and attention to reading and familiarizing themselves with uh, what is known from performance incentives in other fields because this is not a new area. There is an enormous amount of, of literature on uh, performance incentives in the private sector, uh, in the nonprofit service sector, uh, particularly healthcare and medicine, in policing and law enforcement, in job training, in welfare reform. A good bit of it actually has been done by my colleague here on the panel, Karen Heinrich, who's done terrific work, and you all should read it, even though it has nothing to do with education. And education policymakers have generally forged ahead either with application or with enthusiasm for performance incentives without recognizing that many of the problems that are being faced now in education have been faced and analyzed extensively in these other non-education fields. Um, it's often said, and you've heard it said, uh, that, that we should use in performance incentives because that's the way it's done in the private sector. Well, in fact, there is increasing uh, use of performance incentives in the private sector, there is also decreasing use of quantitative measures and performance incentives in the private sector. If you read the business literature, and I've, I've actually spent, as you can tell if you look at this paper, quite a few months reading the literature in, in management journals and business, there are constant warnings of, against using quantitative measures as an important portion of uh, evaluating employees for the purposes of incentives. Perhaps the, the the clearest uh, example of, of uh, quantitative measurement in, in uh, the private sector for, for uh, performance evaluations is the stock market. And we have a whole agency, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which exists almost primarily for the purpose of preventing the kind of gaming and corruption of uh, indicators of reporting of financial uh, statistics that inevitably result when institutions are rewarded for quantitative outcome measures. Uh, as I look at the, the management literature, probably the, I would average the, the conclusion that performance incentive systems in the private sector are recommended by uh, management experts as including no more than 20% quantitative measures, and the other 80% should be qualitative evaluations of one kind or another. So there is an increase in performance incentives in the private sector, but what the data, the surveys of private firms show is there is actually a decrease in the use of quantitative measures. Uh, w. Edwards Demings, the, the, the management guru, put it this way. He said, management by numerical goal is an attempt to manage without knowledge of what to do, and in fact is usually management by fear. The most common uh, recommendation for how to evaluate performance in the private sector now is a system that's called a balanced scorecard, which takes quantitative measurements of output and uh, adds to them a variety of, of not only qualitative output measures, but input measures and so forth. Well, in education, we've had a number of uh, uh, examples uh, that we've discovered since, especially since No Child Be Left Behind, which is an organizational accountability system, not an individual one. Uh, perhaps the biggest one is the, the goal displacement that's taken place under No Child Left Behind, which has led to a lot of disillusionment on the part of many of its early proponents as uh, an, a focus on math and reading, reading scores that results from holding 
schools accountable only for math and reading has led to a diminution of attention to science and social studies and physical education, uh, arts and music. Uh, to uh, early proponents and advocates and very enthusiastic advocates of No Child Left Behind, two former uh, assistant secretaries of education, uh, Diane Ravitch and Chester Finn, recently wrote an article in which they said, we should have seen this coming. More emphasis on some things would inevitably lead to mean less attention to others. We were wrong. We didn't see how completely standards-based reform would turn into a basic skills frenzy. Well, the reason we should have seen this coming is because it's been documented over and over again in other fields. In 1979, Donald Campbell, the great methodologist with whom some of you are familiar in the field of education, but who did a lot of uh, research outside education, formulated what he called Campbell's Law, and the law reads as follows. The more any quantitative social indicator is used for social decision-making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures and the more apt it will be to distort and corrupt the social processes it is intended to monitor. I remember uh, when I was in college many years ago taking a course in the Soviet economy. Uh, the Soviet Union used a lot of performance incentives in order to centrally control a, an economy without market mechanisms. And I remember one example uh, in one of my college textbooks where uh, central planners set an annual goal for shoe production. And because the society was a developing society, they wanted to increase the number of pairs of shoes that were produced each year. And Soviet managers did respond, and they increased the number of shoe, pairs of shoes they produced each year but they produced produce disproportionately small sizes of shoes because that was the way to increase their quota of shoe production using the available leather. And the Soviet uh, population continued to go unshod. There was, a, um, there was a cartoon in a satirical Soviet magazine in the 1950s uh, in which they showed two plant managers of a nail factory uh, standing around bragging to each other about how they had fulfilled their quota for the number of nails they should produce each year and the cartoon showed the nail factory with two cranes suspended, a giant, one giant nail that uh, went across the entire length of the factory because they did increase their tonnage by doing so. There are many... Is that left or gone? <laughs> no, five left. Okay. Uh, there are many, many other uh, examples. <laughs> many examples of, of this from, from the private sector. Uh, a, a recent study I, I just recently published of the software industry, the enterprise software industry in which firms sell software to large enterprises has a commission, uh, a commission sales schedule in which uh, commission rates increase over time uh, on the theory that it becomes more difficult to uh, sell in software as the market gets saturated. What they found, though, was that three-quarters of all enterprise sales take place on the last day of the calendar quarter because that's the day that the commission rates are higher, and what salesmen figure out how to do is to delay their sales until the commission rates grow up, go, uh, go up. Uh, Peter Blau, the great sociologist, uh, wrote a book uh, in the 1950s called The Dynamics of Bureaucracy, in which he looked at the public sector, and he examined um, uh, employment service, employment offices, which, where they tried to have a, an employee rating system based on the number of interviews of jobless uh, uh, applicants that the, uh, the service conducted. And of course the, the, uh, the employees of the employment service managed to conduct more interviews per day than they had previously, but uh, they didn't place very many people in jobs because they were moving people in and out of interviews so frequently. When they tried to add the number of jobs that, people, that they placed people in, they found that they increasingly placed people in short-term jobs rather than in long, jobs that would last a long time because short-term jobs are easier to place people in than long-term jobs. There's an enormous amount of literature from the medical field. Uh, report cards, a term which we're now becoming increasingly familiar with in education, have been a, a staple of uh, health care and medicine for the last 20 years. And they've been reviewed by uh, the General Accounting Office, for example. Uh, the General Accounting Office concluded that when we try to evaluate medical practices by the uh, number of successful surgeries, for example, or by any of a number of other measures. The GAO concluded, quote, administrators will place all their organization's resources in areas that are being measured. Areas that are not highlighted in report cards will be ignored. Um, 
We have uh, there's uh, studies of the Medicare attempted to um, rate cardiac surgeons by the survival rate of patients under cardiac surgery. What they found was that, and this was in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, what they found was that cardiac surgeons were increasingly figuring out how to do surgery only on the healthiest patients. And the patients who were most at risk of death were not being uh, served. A recent study of, of nursing homes uh, conducted by the, the Medicaid um, office, Medicare and Medicaid office of the federal government, established 15 standards by which nursing homes should be evaluated in order to decide whether they were qualified for uh, reimbursement under Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, standards included things like how often patients were turned over in beds. But there's something like 190 different measures that uh, they had to select from in order to pick the 15 standards that the nursing homes were uh, being evaluated on. And what they found was that, yes, patients were being more often turned over in beds on a regular schedule, but nursing home employees were washing their hands less frequently, leading to more infections, because that happened not to be one of the 15 measures on which um, uh, the nursing homes were evaluated. Um, Okay, that's left. All right, there, in, in, my, uh, in, in my paper, I talk not only about this kind of goal distortion, but uh, the phenomenon of uh, 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 setting threshold effects as, as uh, we do in education with proficiency levels. The same kinds of, of distortions have occurred there. You're familiar with some of them. You know that, um, uh, for example, uh, the Nielsen ratings uh, evaluate uh, uh, television uh, networks for advertising purposes, for rates of advertising, for purposes of advertising rates, and we're all familiar with the fact that the quality of television programming on sweeps weeks is different from the quality of television uh, around the rest of the year. Uh, the New York Times publishes a bestseller list, uh, of uh, which I think many of you probably uh, have looked at to see which books are, are selling the best. They do this by sampling bookstores around the country to see which bookstores uh, are selling which books. Uh, the publishing industry devotes an enormous amount of effort to trying to figure out which bookstores are being sampled so they can send people to purchase books at those stores in order to increase their uh, ratings. The bottom line of, of, of my paper is not that we should not use import performance incentives in education. Uh, the bottom line is, however, that there's an enormous amount of knowledge about the pitfalls in performance incentives Many of these uh, pitfalls are being duplicated in education today by, by uh, researchers and practitioners who have not taken the time or the effort to investigate what is really an enormous literature uh, in both social service fields, in the private sector, and in other uh, government, uh, government agencies. Um, I apologize to you for having such a lengthy paper uh, on, on the web on this but it really is just a literature review and it's just a, a list of example after example of these studies that have lessons that can be learned by educators and by policymakers in education if only we took the time to study them. Thank you. A working paper and the PowerPoint slides used in this presentation are available on the National Center on Performance Incentive website.